name is Mrs. Pingle and I'm on her. Wow. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Art at Home. My name is Mrs. Pingle, in case you're new, and this is my art and art history channel where I focus on all of the things that I teach at the high school level. This is my very first AP Art History Brief. We're going to be talking about Unit 1 in the College Board AP Art History curriculum, which is all about global prehistory. So in this unit, I'm just trying to give a little bit of extra review, kind of a crash course for anyone who is about to take their first test. And there are 11 artworks that I'm going to cover, so here we go. The first one is the Hall of the Bulls from Lascaux Cave. It's dated from around 15,000 to 13,000 BCE. There might be some other resources that say a slightly different date, but that's because everybody's kind of estimating. So anywhere in the teens of the thousands of BCE is gonna be relatively close. But it is made with pigment on rock, which is um, typical for a lot of cave drawings. And it is done in, of course, France in the Lascaux Cave system. So what does this look like? It looks like a lot of different animals, but primarily the large bull stands out the most. And these animals are depicted in what's known as ancient profile view. But what's interesting is that not all of the animal is shown in profile. So this is known as twisted perspective. Whenever we see animals that have horns, um, a lot of times we're gonna see both horns at once which you won't typically see when it is in a strict profile view. But the reason that ancient people did this was because they wanted to show kind of a composite view, which is another term for twisted perspective, of that animal so that you see all aspects of that animal and what it is comprised of all at once. So both horns being shown with all four legs being shown is gonna be the best way for everyone to be able to tell exactly what animal this is. And that is really typical throughout not just the Lascaux cave system, but in just cave drawings in general, you're gonna see a lot of twisted perspective. Um, what else about this work that's really interesting? This is a gigantic cave system. So there are over 650 artworks within this cave, and Hall of the Bulls is one of the most famous. These animals are painted really large and, and a lot of them are really high off the ground. So we think that the ancient people, most likely the Magdalenian culture, would have used scaffolding in order to reach these places in order to paint. We can tell that there are different generations of people that collaborated on this work because obviously this could not have been painted by just one person. So there were lots of successive artists that were using each other's work to inspire their own. And although Lasco has many different scenes of people hunting these animals, this Hall of the Bulls scene is not one of them. And the reason we can tell that is because there's no hunters depicted. So why would they make it? Why would they show animals if it weren't for a hunting purpose? We think that it could be for more of a reverence purpose. They saw these animals as being somewhat sacred. So they would have used something like this as more of a sacred place, like almost like going to church. The next artwork is going to be the Apollo 11 stones from Namibia, which is in Africa, Southern Africa. And it's made of charcoal on stone and it dates from about 25,500 to 25,300 BCE. And there's a really cool story that kind of goes along with this. The Apollo 11 stones was so named because the archaeologists that discovered this in the Namibia cave system would have found it in 1969 and they were supposedly listening to the uh, Apollo space mission and the moon landing as this was happening. And as they're uncovering these stones, they would have heard on the radio, it's one small step for man, but one giant leap for mankind, which is really fitting because they would have found something that was from over 25,000 years ago. We're not exactly sure what kind of animal is depicted on this. It's really up to your interpretation. And the reason for that is because there was no writing in the prehistory days, hence prehistory. The Apollo 11 stones is a good example of people trying to make something in profile view so that it can be recognizable in a non-hunting sort of narrative. The next artwork that we'll cover is The Running Horned Woman, which is from 6,000 to about 4,000 BCE. And it's a rock painting again, this time in Algeria, so also in Africa. And The Running Horned Woman is shown in that ancient profile view, but also twisted perspective. So she's in profile, but the horns that are on her head, which could be a headdress or she could be some sort of goddess, 
Um, either way, they're shown in that twisted perspective so that you see both horns at once, which is important in order to get the full idea of what it looks like. But we think that this is kind of a misnomer because it's titled Running Horned Woman, but in reality, we think she's probably doing some sort of ritual dance, which makes sense if you think about what she's wearing. She's got this kind of ritual clothing and drapery on, and she also has either a scarification pattern or possibly body paint that is dotted and in line patterns across her body. And then in the background, we see people that are perhaps either joining her in this ritual or people that are following her, as well as livestock too. The terracotta fragment or fragments from the Solomon Islands about 1000 BCE, and it's made from terracotta, and it's made from the Lapita culture that lived on the Solomon Islands, which is really cool because they were really well known for their pottery. They had a very distinctive style and way that they would use stamping materials and tools to make these different intricate designs on the outsides of their pottery. And what's significant about this one is that if you look closely, you can see that there is what looks to be a anthropomorphic or human face. And the reason that is so cool is because this is one of the oldest examples that people have found thus far of a human face showing up in pottery. The next artwork we'll cover will be the Tlatilco female figures. I hope I'm saying that right. Tlatilco from 1200 to 900 BCE, and they are made of ceramic, and they are originally from Mexico, from the Tlatilco region. And they're also noted for their pottery and their ceramic figures. And of course, the Tlatilco female figure is one that is specifically in our curriculum that we teach with the APR history class, but there is a large collection of these figures that has been found and they all have very similar characteristics. So in this particular one, it has a bifacial head, which is really interesting because we think that that could possibly be commemorating the first conjoined twins to be born in that region or possible birth defects that people saw and thought that perhaps the baby could be some sort of god or possibly even a demon. And the other deformities that are throughout the body are the short arms and the really thick legs, the really thick thighs. That's another reason why people think that perhaps it was some sort of birth defect but we believe that they could have had some sort of shamanic function or religious significance. But again, we're really not sure because there's no history to back that up. These are just hypotheses. Our next artwork, let's do the anthropomorphic steel, which is from the fourth millennium BCE, somewhere in there. And it's made of sandstone and it's originally from Saudi Arabia. So this is one of the earliest known works from the Arabian Peninsula, which is really significant. They were part of a burial tradition a lot of times these steels would be used as grave markers or as posts and because of that reason they just stayed put and they were a little bit better preserved and we can kind of tell based on its facial features that it is supposed to look somewhat human-like and that's why we call it anthropomorphic which means human appearing or human-like and aside from that there's just not too much more to say kind of see that it's got some sort of belt with perhaps a double-edged sword on it and there is some sort of strap that goes across the body but it's a really mysterious work because we don't know if this was for someone who was important or if it was just for like perhaps a commoner so other than that this work is a little bit more mysterious. Next on our curriculum, we have the Camelid Sacrum in the shape of a canine from about 14,000 to 7,000 BCE. It is made of bone and it is from Mexico. The reason that this is so interesting is because it's carved to look like a skull and it's carved to look like the skull of a different species of animal than the one that the bone actually came from. Camelid, let's go back to that word. Camelid is a camel-like animal. So either a camel or an alpaca or a uh, llama, those are all going to be camelids. The sacrum sits at the bottom of your spine and your skull sits at the top of your spine. So for a lot of pagan religions, the sacrum was like a sacred bone and they thought of it to be as like a second skull. So you have your real skull and then you have your second skull, which would be your sacrum bone. And we think this may have had some sort of shamanic or pagan religion ritual type purpose. We're not sure what that could have possibly been. And so it's interesting that it's carved to be like the skull shape of a canine. And that just goes to show how very far back people have been working with dogs. Our next artwork that we'll talk about, the Jade Kong from the Langju culture in China, which is from around 3300 BCE to 2200 BCE. And it's made of jade, which I actually have a cool example of a jade stone. If you can see that. And this is what it looks like on the other sides. 
So Jade is just this really cool, very hard, um, very durable green rock. So it's a really cool stone to have in a collection if you collect rocks. It is especially interesting the way these were made because jade is such a durable hard stone it can really only be incised this way with a type of sanding technique because they didn't have all the machinery and the metal tools that would have been required to carve this otherwise so they used a special sort of sanding technique in order to make these different line and shape patterns and one of the reasons that these are so well preserved is because they were found in burial sites and in graveyards so we think that they may have been buried with people of very high rank in the society kind of like how people get buried with their jewelry sometimes these are very similar to that because these would have been very expensive and um, difficult to make and though we don't know too much about the designs or what they could possibly mean there is some significance with the outside of the jade kong design having somewhat of a facial design where you can kind of see two eyes and a mouth um, we think that that could possibly be the face of a deity. We're not sure about that though, that's really up for speculation. The entire shape of the Kong could have some sort of spiritual significance with representing the earth and the heavens, but again, we're not exactly sure. The next artwork we'll talk about is the Ambum Stone, which is from the Ambum Valley in Papua New Guinea, and it was made around 1500 BCE, and it is made from Greywalk, which is another very, very hard stone and very difficult to carve, which makes this very interesting that someone would have taken the time and the effort to make something like this out of Greywalk. This is another very perplexing piece because there's a lot of uh, speculation about the function of this work. It could be that it's just meant to be a shamanic object where it could have religious significance or possibly be used in some sort of ritual. One theory is that this object could have been some sort of mortar and pestle device where you would take the bowl and you would grind herbs or possibly other materials to use for whatever you want. But uh, we think that because of the way the belly and the arms of the Ambum Stone are shaped kind of like a bowl, that that is a possible use for this. Another possible theory is that this is meant to be either an anteater or possibly a baby or embryo anteater or that it could even be a human that is wearing some sort of anteater mask. Okay, we have just a couple more. The next one is Beaker with Ibex motifs and that's from 4200 BCE to about 3500 BCE. It's made out of terracotta and it's originally from Iran. And so what's interesting about this one is the design on the outside of it. We know that it's hand painted because of the small irregularities and we do believe that it was made by hand as well and not with a wheel, a throwing wheel that you would often make uh, different bowls on uh, because of the irregularities in the walls. However, it is so very thin. It's almost as though it was made with some sort of machine because of how thin and delicate it is, but that is still to be determined. It was found in a burial site. And so this is another artwork that has to do with burial practices. The Ibex motifs is the goat pattern that you see that has the long horns that wrap around these were common animals that were often seen near Iran. And we would think that this perhaps could identify with some sort of particular group or perhaps family, that each member of that group or family would have something that looked like this and then perhaps be buried with it when they died. And this was discovered when archaeologists actually were going looking for Daniel's tomb. And that's the Daniel from the Bible in Daniel in the Lion's Den. Next artwork we'll talk about is probably my favorite in Unit 1. It is Stonehenge from Wiltshire, England on the Salisbury Plain, and it's made around 2500 BCE to 1600 BCE. And the function of Stonehenge has really been the topic that everyone has some sort of theory about. But the biggest uh, and most obvious one to me that seems the most correct is that it's some sort of astronomical calendar because the way it's built, it has specific stones that mark the sun rise and sunset on specific days. So there is a large stone that sits outside of the cromlech or the stone circle, which is called the heel stone. And the heel stone marks the sunrise on the summer solstice. And there's another set of trilithons, which are those three stone groups with two stone uprights and one capstone laying across the top. There is one of those trilithon sets that marks the winter solstice at sunrise. So we for sure know that every single year the sun rises on the summer solstice over the heel stone and the sun sets on the winter solstice between those trilithons. 
So that can't be a coincidence. That's definitely something they did on purpose. This is a really good example of post and lintel constructions. So the posts are those two stone uprights that I mentioned, and the lintel is the horizontal beam that runs across the top, often known as the capstone. And what's really impressive about this is that these stones are huge and they were brought from miles away to this spot in order to be used in the construction of Stonehenge. Some of them weigh over 50 tons. So the fact that so many people pitched in to make this work must have meant that this was a really important thing to them in their religion in order to either worship the sun or to have some sort of ritual space where they recognize the sun and all that good stuff. The last artwork I want to talk to you about is not actually in our 250 works that we study in our AP Art History curriculum, but I think it should be. I think it used to be, but they changed it at some point. Either way, they should bring it back because it is the Venus of Willendorf, otherwise known as the Venus of Willendorf, but it's Austrian and W's are pronounced like B's, so the Venus of Willendorf. And I have a small replica here that I got off of Amazon and she's just glorious, I love her. I like to show this in class, at least I did before COVID and we can't pass things around anymore. So some facts about the Venus of Willendorf. She was created somewhere between 28,000 to 25,000 BCE. She was discovered in Austria. And of course the subject matter is a woman she is a very voluptuous woman, which would have been a very big pro in the Paleolithic era. If you were a little bit larger and had more meat on your bones, you were more likely to one, survive childbirth, and two, be able to keep that child alive once the child is born. So fertility was a very, very important topic to early people um, in order to grow the tribe and to keep their population strong. Another thing that's really interesting about the Venus of Willendorf is she doesn't have a face. And the reason for that is either her identity was not important because she wasn't supposed to be anyone in particular, or she's just supposed to be kind of this anonymous, anybody could be her, anybody could aspire to be her sort of woman. She does have this interesting texture around her head, which is supposed to be some sort of either um, headdress or possibly um, the pattern of her hair or the texture of her hair. The size, this is the actual size of the real Venus of Willendorf, which is located in Austria still. The reason why it's so small is because in the Paleolithic era, they were hunter-gatherers. They weren't going to stay put very long in one place, and so any artworks that they made were either going to be handheld little sculptures like this, or they could be possibly like functional cooking or storage materials such as pots. Another option would have been, of course, the cave drawings. Those were never meant to be taken with them when they moved. They would go there, they would leave their mark as they were there, and then they would leave and other artists would come in and discover it and do the same thing. So one last thing that's important about the Venus of Willendorf is her name. She was discovered in Willendorf, so that would have been where she was from. But the reason we call her a Venus is because we think she was meant to be some sort of fertility figure or goddess, kind of like the Roman goddess Venus. So that's where they get that term from, even though she was long before the Romans ever existed. She was discovered afterward and therefore named after the Roman goddess of fertility and beauty and love. So that is a quick overview of all of the works in Unit 1 for AP Art History. I hope this was helpful for you. Even if you're not one of my students, hopefully this is helpful to you in your own AP Art History class. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like button and hit the subscribe button so that you can see more art history briefs and other art tutorial style videos. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye!